regards to minting, if uh, minting doesn't work well, there is another system which is that of uh, bitcoins that can replace the central banks. So central banks and uh, bitcoins uh, will compete. It will compete, however, not in all areas. The, Another important topic is banking loan. So if we want to buy a house, the bank uh, gives us the amount we need, and then we have to pay it back uh, um, throughout uh, installments uh, and the interest rate. Changing this method would be very difficult, especially in the in the short run. So cryptocurrencies may become portfolios or safe assets. We, we, by safe asset, we mean a tool that is uh, independent from the choices made by the policymakers. Si parla molto anche delle cosiddette central bank digital currencies. Quindi central la bank digital currencies are cryptocurrencies issued by central banks. Central bank digital currencies is not an appropriate uh, term because the central bank digital currencies are mostly related to the possibility to open bank accounts uh, uh, by the central banks, so the possibility for central banks to uh, lend money by depositing them into bank accounts uh, uh, that have been opened uh, in their bank. So it wouldn't allow for decentralization, which uh, is uh, uh, a key trait of cryptocurrencies. And I'm saying so because either you trust central banks, uh, their efficiency, or it would be difficult to pursue uh, a system in which uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and central bank um, coexist. So thank you very much for your attention. Per molti versi abbiamo abbiamo visto cose anche illuminanti nel senso che ci conferma che come moneta a meno di non trovarsi in una situazione drammatica una criptovaluta a cryptocurrency without a central bank it can unlikely change our life. For other things like investment in a diversified portfolio, it's something that we can think about. But blockchain technology and more generally um, distributed ledger technologies can sustain real economy in a different way with different projects. I'd like to ask Professor Fazio to present her uh, speech. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you all for inviting me and thanks to the Pontifical University Regina Postolorum, uh, the rector, my rector, uh, Father Barajon, uh, who really appreciates uh, this good positive contamination between the two uh, universities with the same objectives, educational objectives. I'd like to thank you for inviting me. And together with Father Ryan, uh, I was convinced uh, to reflect on this topic. Uh, we started with Father Ryan to reflect on the topic during um, ethics and economy and the matches between ethics and economy, and in particular on entrepreneurship, which is my focus. During pandemic in Italy, there 
economic fabric is made up uh, mainly of uh, small and medium enterprises, as you know. Um, I'd like to um, thank Father Farrell. He mentioned uh, fundamental figures like Hayek. We know that for us, uh, they are authors at the big, at the basis of our education. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Don Baraldi. He showed us that <laughs> in the world of uh, sacred art, one of the element which is essential to assess the cultural and entrepreneurial heritage But I also made some steps backward. I am an economist. I have worked on currencies. And now I work with entrepreneurs. And I'm also an investor in entrepreneurs and uh, enterprises. <clears throat> My students. are a source of inspiration for me because they are the entrepreneurial fabric. There wouldn't be any reflection on cryptocurrencies and blockchain if there was no real economy. So last week I took part in the blockchain week and I saw so many young students uh, dealing with such a technical matter, which because also cryptocurrencies as uh, Professor Traficante explained, has elements of pure finance. So we had to train on finance for years, uh, seeing young people aged 18 to 23 telling us how they created uh, cryptocurrencies and how they wanted to launch them on the market and how they negotiated them. It was so interesting, so inspiring. So we have to train on innovation. We have to be trained on innovation. I was asked to, uh, to be uh, technical and to um, talk about distributed ledger technology. And I have to be honest, I had to study how technically these systems worked. These ledgers that issued certifications, certificates that um, go beyond the classical certifications. They are not just catalogs or descriptions of economic activities. Those of you who um, who have uh, who does economic uh, consultancy services know what I'm talking about. So I decided to um, structure my short speech. And I'll also thank, uh, thank you for the video clip because it was a very precise and concise summary of the subject. So what are DLT and how they can integrate in the innovation fabric in Italy? So where are we in Italy uh, in innovation? <clears throat> In the, in the European context and in the global context. If we think, talk about innovation in Italy, we also have to address the inter in entrepreneurship, the ability to, um, to be entrepreneurs and the support to the development of economic activities. The entrepreneurial uh, fabric of Italy is um, represented mainly by uh, 
the certification of the Made in Italy, I will show you some figures which uh, companies represent our country. And given the context, I'd like to make some considerations on the relation between innovation and ethics. If there is such relation and how it can be structured and shaped and certified in blockchain. We've been told that blockchain is an, if, an IT protocol established in the 90s. It's um, dissemination and it's um, wide scale use was um, obtained through cryptocurrencies. And the most famous cryptocurrency is the Bitcoin. But from my, what I have seen and studied, it's a mistake to, uh, to say that uh, blockchain is only a cryptocurrency. Uh, blockchain is um, a technology, is part of the DLT technologies, which are systems based uh, on ledgers, distributed ledgers. So systems where all the knots of a network have the same copy on a database, which can be read and modified independently by the same knots. But in the distributed database, if all the knots having a copy of the database can consult it, but need validators or central entity to modify them or to insert new data. Just think of uh, cert certifying um, financial reports. The um, changes to the ledger are modified by consensus algorithms and they are updated independently by the participants of the network. Uh, beyond, besides the um, algorithms, the uh, security and transparency of the ledger, DLT and blockchain also widely use cryptography. So, There, there has to be a security system for this data. If all this is true, given to the use of blockchain, uh, a system which is fastly evolving, even more rapid than the human banks can, it's a speed uh, that um, it's, a, it's also difficult to understand. Uh, artificial intelligence systems are being developed um, as well. But in my opinion, we are far from saying that DLT technologies can rightly support entrepreneurs. We have been told because we have to know that uh, the information that we uh, that are made available are true. Information is true than is real. The truthfulness of information and data is um, it's a volatile component and it doesn't allow to be readable except in the moment in which it's read. We know that in the, inter in the enterprises, we are still uh, linked to the uh, financial reports being deposited every year. So we couldn't be <clears throat> allowed a loan by a bank uh, if we have an activity which is 
which is so volatile and and which is not immediately recognizable and uh, modifiable. This is true, but all the transactions on blockchain are tracked by all participants, and so we can say that operations transactions are transparent without the intervention of a central entity or a third party being the intermediary or broker. As a consequence, the evolution of quantum computers and the theoretical possibility of controlling a consistent number of knots in the network Uh, also have uh, imply some risks. We still have concentration of data, which are extremely complex and disseminated so that they can be easily read. It's true that uh, today the characteristics which are, which these characteristics um, has, is the ability to develop automatic transactions. We, we have been uh, hearing about smart contract and how the blockchain technology can activate smart working negotiations. Yeah, let's think of the use of blockchain in public administration. So speed of supply and demand meeting and the attempt to optimize a system. But how much do we have in Italy of, of this? Because we always have to maintain a perspective on our territory. So how is blockchain used? Today, the market of cryptocurrencies in Italy is still very little compared to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. This is certain, but we are still in a moment in which we have to run and reflect deeply on this topic if we don't want to lag behind. In June 2021, uh, on the 27 European countries, Italy was the first to be defined as innovative. So we have four categories leader in the nations, uh, innovators, moderate, uh, innovators and emerging innovators. We are, we ranked 12. First in this ranking is Sweden, followed by Finland, Denmark, Belgium, which are, despite this ranking, still, they're still class, uh, classified as strong innovators. They're still not considered as innovation leaders. To give you some figures, I did this analysis. I started to see, uh, to analyze the rankings. So we have Cyprus and Malta uh, before Italy and Spain. Where is Spain? I was asked. Spain in this ranking. So after Cyprus, Malta, there is Slovenia, and then there is Spain, last, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary. All the technology and the majority in percentages of concentrations of blockchain 
and use of cryptocurrencies is in the hand of innovation leaders. So there is a long way to go and we still have time. <clears throat> what are we lacking in Italy? How can we enter this system also thanks to uh, the blockchain and DLT? In my opinion, this is my personal opinion, in our country, we still have a, too little attention to research and development. We don't have research and development compared to other European countries. And uh, in terms of uh, GDP percentage, um, there are only a few uh, big and medium enterprises. And recently, um, many Italian innovative companies were uh, purchased by uh, foreign multinationals. We have difficulties to invest on innovation with grants in universities. Universities should be the centers of their research for uh, good education, but they're still just little supported. Let's think of the grants for PhD programs. We're still lagging behind and enterprises um, pay the costs, uh, education costs, and there is to lose the students um, once they are educated because there is no investment on research and development. We are going forward, especially thanks to Industry 4.0. The entrep entrepreneurial fabric in Italy is represented by 4.4 million enterprises. 95% is represented by micro enterprises, meaning uh, enterprises with less than 10 employees, 95%. Followed by SMEs inter, uh, with uh, 10 to 200 um, employees. And then big companies representing employment with 250 employees and uh, just 0.1% in our country. These figures may be striking, but they are very much aligned with our neighbors, neighboring countries. Uh, small and medium, <clears throat> small uh, and micro enterprises uh, also have the major stake uh, in France and Germany and Austria. In, in Italy, big uh, enterprises in Germany, uh, the big companies represent the 0 0.49. So it means five, five times more than the, uh, than the amount of big companies in Italy. In Italy, we have the so-called made in Italy. Made in Italy is recognized at a global level with a certificate. It is a certificate, was created as a certificate uh, to uh, combat counterfeiting. In recent years, it was regulated. The labeling of a Made in Italy products um, were, was regulated. So the origin of goods is now certified. 
And in 2004, the financial bill uh, declared that the Made in Italy label on products which are not originally Italian are subject to a fine. And the fine is higher, and the sanctions are higher if it's food or beverage. <clears throat> DLT can help uh, speed up uh, certifications. If it's true that the certification is ruled and it's um, introduced in a system giving real knowledge of the production chain, if you read on a label of a bottle of wine, a DOC or um, Italian flag. Well, there is a certification behind that. So if we can do it with a token, uh, we would streamline bureaucracy a lot. But I am also a bit critic as an entrepreneur. How can I certify what is defined the, uh, as experience? Made in Italy becomes an experience. Made in Italy is reflects the uh, craftsmanship of Italy. If you look at the excellencies of the made in Italy in the world of food. <laughs> the goods which are sold exclusively on foreign markets, you would realize that balsamic vinegar is still produced as it was 50 years ago. How can you certify um, this? How can you certify uh, and the origin, the control origin of um, a barrel, for example? And how can you explain to a six years old uh, craftsman that he has to that he has to use the blockchain? Well, that's a problem. Um, Okay, um, I'm, if the keywords uh, decentralization, participation, transparency, well, uh, we have a task with social economy and entrepreneurs to integrate these new technologies. And on the other side, if innovation by definition is making things new, adapt things to social processes. Economy is a social science by definition. We also have to make an effort, in my opinion, to educate rather than inform. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have a connection from Dubai. Um, Valle Fuoco, a lawyer. Dubai is a very interesting place uh, where <coughs> investors in uh, cryptocurrencies uh, go because there is no law on income. So you can have a financial savings because it's a very new product and it's um, not very much widespread. So it's not clear how it can be treated fun, uh, from a fiscal point of view. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, especially the working group of the Pontifical University that asked me to participate, Roberto Serafini, Padre Ryan, Mr. Bova, and Selva Silvestri. Thanks to 
all of you because you've had uh, an innovative idea in organizing this meeting. When speaking about this topic, I make reference to one of the main legal experts, uh, Carle Rutti, Italian. He said that between economy and ethics, there is a bridge, and this bridge is the law. And currently, we need the legislative regulation to regulate these transactions. I can share with you my um, direct experience in the field of cryptocurrencies. Together with the newspaper, Il Sole 24 Ora, and at the end of 2017, we wrote an article called Bitcoin Generation. I had to write the rules of cryptocurrencies. You've mentioned Dubai. In Dubai, the use of cryptocurrencies is illegal. However, there is um, a blurred zone, a free there are some free zones in which you can decide which kind of currency you want to use. And this is the reason why even in Dubai, where the use of cryptocurrencies is illegal, they are exploring new avenues to regulate the use of cryptocurrencies. Historically, uh, we've always had people um, um, opting for regulations and people who would rather avoid the regulation of uh, financial markets. However, if like me, you uh, are looking for uh, a higher regulation of the field, I guess you're right. When SEC shared that uh, ITF uh, went for a cryptocurrency, the old market uh, went through a boost and uh, it worked as a leverage for the traditional market as well. Uh, therefore, the type of regulation that is being applied throughout so soft law measures could represent uh, a moment for a further expansion of uh, the uh, phenomenon. Quite often I speak with financial intermediaries at a very high level, and most of those times they already have a working group or a department that analyzes cryptocurrencies and their developments. They consider cryptocurrencies as a possibility for investments. As for my presentation, I'm going to be quite quick because we don't have much time left. And because I've uh, heard that previous speakers have already mentioned some points I was supposed to mention in my presentation. The topic includes sociological and technological uh, elements as well as uh, uh, legal elements and taxation uh, elements because if uh, wealth uh, is generated, uh, taxation comes into place as well. We've already mentioned the definition of, black, of blockchain. We've already covered the, the economic uh, and financial uh, element, so there's a kind of rejection towards this topic by the oversight. How can we consider 
this cryptocurrency that today is defined also as a virtual asset. We keep writing cryptocurrencies, so however, we should say uh, digital assets. So this morning, uh, the Sole 24 Ore published an article of mine uh, about this field, about this topic. So the functions of the illegal currency are three. They are unit of measures, they are ways uh, for payments, and they are also um, they also act as a storage of value. While cryptocurrency do not fulfill any of these three functions, however, they provide for different systems for different risks. The first risk is that of uh, systemic risk uh, because it could the capital currencies can be used to highlight uh, to hide the owner of those assets the european supervisor authorities uh, warn the general public about the instability of cryptocurrencies about the, the absence of transparency the absence of liquidity the absence well so um, the authorities uh, gave several warnings. However, it is similar to the commercial law. It follows the practice. So there were already these ICOs, initial conferring coin that led to the issue of uh, different tokens so there are payment tokens utility tokens asset tokens and the so-called hybrid tokens which are tokens that i used for uh, all the previous functions anti uh, money laundering authorities uh, were the first one to uh, raise the issue that's why we have an eba opinion from 2014 a financial action force uh, with their paper from 2014 and an action plan drafted by the european commission throughout the fifth directive that defined uh, virtual currencies defined the exchanges and defined the wallet providers so why is the definition so important this is important because if you don't have a legal definition uh, you cannot even uh, you can't uh, identify uh, wrongdoings that's why the fifth directive definition is so important. The fourth directive didn't provide for any um, provisions about cryptocurrencies uh, because they were introduced by the fifth currency. Uh, in Italy, we were quite ahead because uh, with the fourth directive and the uh, legislative decree of uh, 2017, we defined cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, wallet providers and exchanges. Some other countries uh, criticized us uh, and uh, I myself uh, had some organized auditions with other experts uh, to analyze this decision. And in fact, we were the forerunners of this definition. Then this is the reason why uh, some uh, try some sentences such as the one of the uh, court of verona uh, that uh, defined uh, cryptocurrencies as an investment uh, followed uh, the italian definition of cryptocurrencies the I'm not going to delve into the European directive because we don't have much time. However, I want to say that this directive deals with the service providers whose activities that of providing exchange and portfolio services that are not uh, the object of a legal control. 
both the fourth and the fifth, both the third and the fourth uh, directive didn't consider cryptocurrencies, while the fifth one uh, can included it. So there are several references to the EU uh, legislation until the alleged delega of, of uh, 2016 that included the fourth directive within the fourth directive of the EU, there's already a definition of a virtual currency that works as a digital representation of the value, which is not issued by a central bank or a public authority, and which is not connected to a currency that is used as an, a, um, a tool for exchange. Subsequently, the uh, virtual currency is not guaranteed by central bank, but it is used as an investment tool. So it means that the, we have moved to the cryptocurrency concept to the virtual currency and will end up uh, defining it as virtual assets. The anti-money laundering is always a forerunner of this, and they must act so because they fight against criminals. Uh, usually uh, compliance bodies uh, are quicker than uh, criminal organizations and uh, the EU and the Italian institutions have an added value when it comes to fighting against uh, criminal organizations. No, another important element is the definition of virtual service providers and of the wallet service providers. Why did the anti-recycling and anti-money laundering bodies in Italy uh, went for these definitions? Well, because there's always a need for definitions, because if in Italy we were to apply this legislation, if, if in Italy when it, you want to become a digital service provider, you must register into an official register for uh, virtual assets uh, providers. So the subjects will be included. This is the state of the art from the point of view of money laundering. This uh, piece of legislation allowed for the last uh, legal provisions to consider cryptocurrencies as tools that may be laundered I'm trying not to call it cryptocurrency and call it a digital asset. However, cryptocurrency is a more used term. So we've had the Bank of Italy, UIF and concept that uh, over time integrated the current registration the bank of italy measures uh, are quite famous in our sector and uh, the uh, concept introduced an authority an oversight for the financial market Have from this legal identification, there are several considerations that may be highlighted. From the point of view of the civil law, we should think whether cryptocurrencies could 
be considered as a traditional currencies? The answer is no. However, they can be used by those who want so uh, voluntarily. Is it an, inf an IT document? Uh, there are some pros and cons. So this is a mobile good, and uh, it is also uh, and the question is also about whether this is a financial asset. Uh, it is not a financial asset, but if it is used publicly, it may become as one. As for anti-laundry uh, discipline, we should mention that legislative decree from 2017, number 90, and since that legislative decree considers it as a currency, um, sorry, there's been a problem with the sound in the English booth. We'll resume as soon as possible. Uh, oltre che segnalate se provengono da operazioni sospette e quindi con tutto il regime che deriva dall'antiriciclaggio, ma vanno tassate? Beh, ecco, su questo... There's also another major concern is about the taxation of cryptocurrencies. If we uh, are thinking whether, if you're thinking on whether it is appropriate or not, uh, we have to analyze several points. And in fact, yesterday night, and, and uh, in 2016, a ministerial resolution recalled the sentence of the Court of Justice that said that cryptocurrencies could not be um, the object of taxation due to a sentence that had been issued at the European level. The Court of Justice defined cryptocurrencies as a source of, as a way of payment, so it couldn't be subject to VAT. However, could Italy and other countries Switzerland considers it as an uh, object of taxation. So could Italy and other country consider this uh, as a generator of value? People who bought Bitcoins uh, for uh, 10 cents, now they have uh, 10,000 euros. So uh, you see the difference is quite high. So from 2016 to 2018, we uh moved on and uh, we uh repeated what we said about virtual currency we used what it was included within uh, anti laundry uh, with money money laundry and so it was accepted that cryptocurrencies were going to be the object of uh, the uh, controlling activity of an oversight If wallets uh, provide for over 51,000 euros, there is a difference in the margin, and 25% so of this margin has to be paid. There's no IVAFE. However, uh, the monitoring for non-financial actors is compulsory. This is uh, the measure that was published yesterday, the one I mentioned before. It is about uh, the uh, ownership of uh, virtual currencies in digital wallets with the possess of uh, private keys and the obligation for monitoring. So if I'm a private citizen and I have private keys and I'm not relying on foreign service providers or other intermediaries, so I own my own private keys. And thanks to this private keys, I have the possibility 
So, I, I mean, I, I, I have the possibility of not declaring uh, my operations, uh, but if I exchange one cryptocurrency with another, we know that uh, in, on top of Bitcoins, we have uh, second and third generation currencies. There's a wide range of uh, cryptocurrencies. So, if there's an exchange among cryptocurrencies, so such a transaction must be uh, the object of taxation. It must be included within the RW framework. And uh, even though a person has a private key, since such private key is referred to cryptocurrency, which is considered as a foreign currency, if they are not uh, linked to a bank that is authorized in Italy, they fall into the scope of RW. Um, of RW. So they are treated as foreign currency. Well, my idea is the following one. There are some rules. They have to be codified within an administrative practice, but they must also be integrated so that the others have a clear legislation on top of the regulations of the uh, National Revenue Office. When consumers didn't have this perception and the monitoring declaration and taxation uh, were absent, uh, and there has to be a certain degree of uh, um, chaos uh, uh, with regards to the legislation. So major steps forward must be made in order to um, identify a clear regulation and to provide pieces of legislation for people who use uh, cryptocurrencies so that they can act uh, 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 legally, uh, we must know that there are actors that uh, fall under a certain regulations and people who do not uh, fall under certain regulations. But those who are not declaring what they do with cryptocurrencies are, of course, uh, uh, acting out of the law. If you are not uh, declaring real revenues, of course, uh, you are uh, in a fiscal heaven, but that's not the case for Italy. Um, I hope I've been, uh, I, I hope I have contributed to this interesting debate. I guess that if we all abide the law, we can be ethical and we'll be able to uh, help the others to do charity and we uh, avoid spreading concern among uh, people receiving um, cryptocurrencies. So thank you very much and uh, I think that the most important element is that of uh, abiding the law and the regulations. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I am available. Even if you want to write questions to me directly throughout my email address, you can see on this slide. Well, we can say that if there were people who felt like becoming rich with cryptocurrencies, Thanks to your um, regulate, thanks to your presentation, may have understood that this is not that easy. Before we mention the uh, police, and we, in fact, we have Maggiore Carlo della Gatta. Uh, 
authorities quite often have to uh, deal with this uh, reality because uh, 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 criminal organizations have learned to use uh, cryptocurrencies uh, throughout ransomware and other uh, tools uh, and quite often cryptocurrencies are used to make payments because they are quite secret and they're not that controlled you have the floor good afternoon thank you for inviting me this is an important uh, moment in which we can have a dialogue from different perspectives this is a new um area but well to be honest this area is well integrated in our economic system from an investigational point of view uh, we deal with it as a real problem as uh, the speakers before me said it's difficult to face to deal with this area especially when the interpretations are very vague so it's um <coughs> Lawyer Vallefuoco said that since um, 2014, the technological systems, these technologies create new uh, opportunities for terrorists and criminals. As a police force, We try to develop antibodies to combat these forms of these possible forms of um, crimes uh, in the financial sector on a national and international level. Uh, we did so um, in cooperation with other police forces and the judiciary. Um, it's very technical and delicate subjects. So, in 1976, uh, a special group for um, uh, currency and financial police was created, uh, dealing with uh, currency crimes, uh, anti-money laundering, and so it was the first subject to be involved in such activities, fighting uh, crimes in this area. It's not a, a structure that it's uh, sufficient. We have uh, specialized groups in every uh, major city of the provinces, of the Italian provinces. We have a main group working in Rome, but it's also a network of territorial departments uh, which represent uh, and detect emerging um, trends. Let's not forget that the financial uh, system can be used also by terrorism. So the uh, financial police force also have uh, specialized groups for um, fighting um, uh, the financing of uh, terrorist activities. Despite all the loopholes in the, in the legislation, the legislation meet the needs quite well. <coughs> there are special departments detecting all suspect um, uh, activities. As Vallefoco said, virtual assets and wallet providers are subjects which have have been subject to anti-money laundering uh, obligations, but all the other um, uh, subjects like uh, brokers, uh, banks, notaries, uh, lawyers, gaming operators are subject to anti-money laundering and we <coughs> detect abnormalities and problems. So, 
digitali. Quindi noi attraverso le segnalazioni di operazioni sospette... We try to create a special group on cryptocurrency and there are... And we give inputs to the special groups for investigations. And we also investigate information coming from the Financial Intelligence Unit in um, countries abroad, and they are submitted to the Guardia di Finanza, the Financial Police Forces in Italy. And then we also perform inspections and controls um, to, on subjects which are subject to the anti-money laundering laws. And then there's uh, uh, investigations on behalf of the judicial police on the entire national territory. <clears throat> We fight the financing of terrorism, and also there is a system of corporate, international cooperation of the police forces. And last but not least, uh, we also perform operational risk analysis because the impact of crypto variances on um, crimes should be analyzed, channeled, to adjust the right investigational tools. Uh, so just uh, a quick overview of uh, anti-money laundering um, system. We have uh, the uh, units of international uh, financial intelligence communicating with the Bank of Italy, checking and investigating with a data bank and judiciary and with uh, precise analysis of the financial activities to disseminate uh, um, information with the anti-mafia department and uh, the department of other police forces and the financial police so i will be very quick and um, I just, uh, I just give you some figures regarding the so-called antibodies of the financial system to fight um, <clears throat> the illicit use of um, virtual assets. Uh, the suspect operations are more than 100,000 every year. And we have an increase by 10, 20 percent. So the um, subjects subject to anti-money laundering legislation are inspecting and investigated, uh, investigate this. Uh, they're reporting on uh, virtual assets. So operations performed with uh, cryptocurrencies, you, uh, it's several thousand, so banks especially, as we will see later. Uh, the major uh, subjects reporting illicit crimes, but also brokers and then uh, professionals and other financial operators. Another aspect which I'd like to underline is the territorial classification. Lombardy is the region in Italy which is mostly affected by these kind of crimes. It's the part of the territory where um, operations of this kind are mainly reported. And then there is a second data which is known defined. Uh, there are a number of operations which are reported to the authorities but cannot be localized. So uh, why am I saying this? Um, because through reporting and judicial police investigations, the Guardia di Finanza can increase its know-how. And I'd like to um, express some considerations on the, uh, on the most complex issues of um, encountered by investigators. First of all, as the speakers before me said, it's not necessary uh, to uh, know my counterpart uh, in the DLT because cryptography uh, algorithm can uh, guarantee the transaction on my behalf. And so um, 
So you have already mentioned that transparency, decentralization and safety, they have to be balanced with other um, uh, other characteristics, so lack of regulation, anonymous uh, nature of transactions, and the risk for investors in the financial and economic system. And also some other considerations on traceability, because um, as a paradox, um, transaction uh, with cryptocurrency can be e more easily traced rather than the transac financial transactions in the traditional systems because um, it's a public ledger, it's publicly accessible. On the contrary, there is privacy and confidentiality on financial economic data uh, kept by banks. So you need authorizations to access them. So to trace, trade the traceability of transactions do not, uh, does not require um, uh, special softwares. But um, investigations uh, encounter difficulties in passing from uh, virtual to real. So when you try to identify the physical subject, the person or the group behind a transaction, so behind the alphanumeric code, the nickname, uh, instead of calling it anonymous uh, nature, it's um, it's not anonymous. It's a code uh, connected with a name, a surname, and a date of birth. And traceability um, is also counterbalanced by systems protecting anonymity. And they uh, also uh, make use of systems um, which uh, avoid the traceability of transaction. And so there are also systems to make it difficult to come to the origin of the transaction. And uh, cryptocurrency currencies are detached from usual legal jurisdictions. We don't know where the subjects are, what, how the transactions are managed, if there is a company behind them, and it's difficult to understand if the where the company is based if such company exists uh, what's the consequences of the what's the consequence of this uh, on investigations you have to start international cooperation because information are not limited to the national territory data is something that can be accessed but they are owned by others. So you need international cooperation channels. And of course, you the times, the response time is longer. And most of those operators, knowing the relations between states, are based in territories which are not cooperative. And so also the cooperation activities among states are limited, are blocked. And so it's difficult for authorities to collect information, the information they need. It's, uh, I'd like to draw a parallel like with some applications like FinTech, so cross-border uh, payment um, systems. Uh, it's platforms for payments and they have a well-defined regulatory framework. They are well-regulated uh, activities, but in this case, especially in Europe with the European passport, there are platforms making it difficult 
to obtain data because it's not like going to an Italian bank or to an Italian authority and asking for the access to some data or information. You have to request financial data to a foreign uh, entity. And so the same considerations, um, I said before, apply. So long response time and slow response time. And so we lack uh, legislation framework because also the initiatives of individual states like Italy, for example, were not uh, effective to contrast um, uh, uh, a trend which goes beyond the national territory. <clears throat> uh, lawyer Vallejuoco already mentioned it. There are some risks for savers because there is not a surveillance authority and regulament and regulation and there is a lack of availability of information on uh, uh, the price determination modes but also volatility of listings and uh, also the lack of technical knowledge to understand what's happening uh, but it's also the economic and financial system as a whole, which is open to frauds and manipulation of the market. And um, especially in relation with initial coin offering and then um, recycling of money and financing terrorism. And one last consideration on pers perspectives and outlook for the future. Well, um, we need a reference regulation. I'd like to uh, mention a sentence uh, by Fabio Panetta when uh, the digital euro, the need of a digital euro was um, thought of. And he said that in future we will do what is necessary uh, for uh, our currency to be up to the challenges of progress in the awareness that we cannot remain still. So uh, we cannot neglect basic values and there are new uh, opportunities for the future. One last consideration on NFT, non-fungible token. And their regulations um, do not involve NFTs. As Gaffi mentioned, there are cases in which uh, the purchase of um, the sale of NFT <coughs> does not meet the standard defined in the regulation. So even at international level, some sales of NFTs are excluded. So what Gaffi uh, invites to do is to apply standards, Gaffi standards case by case. And then uh, there are some proposal uh, at European level to make virtual assets service providers uh, uh, subject to the same regulations of uh, traditional uh, financial brokers, uh, publishing white papers, um, uh, unique authorization pathway and solidity of assets. Thank you. Um, we were talking about regulating regulating uh, virtual assets providers as fin traditional financial uh, operators. We have Andrea Ferrero, who is a virtual asset provider managing a platform on Bitcoins. So there is a boom in investment and there is a lot of interest. Uh, cryptocurrency platforms advertised by uh, during football matches. They're very popular. So what are you doing as a platform to avoid excessive risks um, in financial terms? 
Buongiorno a tutti innanzitutto e Good grazie. Buongiorno, signori e signori, grazie per invitarmi qui oggi. Perché purtroppo ho una riunione molto importante che mi parte. I have to be very short because in 10 minutes I have to I have another meeting. So quite briefly I'll try to tell you about our viewpoint. We are uh market players and we have decided to buy a digital asset platform first of all we have to clarify one point because uh, some speakers said that some speakers said something that is not concrete bitcoin is a currency it is not a financial product so this is something we have to clarify because sec uh, rick acknowledged and recognized Bitcoins uh, as a currency. So Bitcoin is not a security or a financial product. Bitcoin is a currency. And it's been recognized as such by uh, European bodies. Otherwise, uh, a different approach should be uh, taken when analyzing Bitcoins. So we uh, only deal with anti-money laundering uh, policies. I'm going to tell you about the approach uh, we use to build Young, which is a platform. Our vision is that of uh, creating a new platform for Crypto companies. Crypto companies is the third generation of companies. We have tech companies. We have first generation companies. Tech companies are the uh, companies that boomed over the uh, last decade. And we think that the third uh, generation of companies it was formed by crypto company. And this is what uh, we are trying to do with Young Platform. It is a way to have a digital asset that can be distributed among the customers and to increase their engagement. The key points I'm going to use to describe the proposal of Young and the approach we used in building this company are three. The main one is an aspect related to educating customers as you can see from this slide, we don't build a single digital product that allow for the purchase of digital assets, but we build a range of digital assets. So our product uh, satisfy any needs, the needs of customers who've only heard about Bitcoins and don't know where to start from, and to those clients who want to invest a small part of their portfolio in Bitcoins, up until those clients who are very advanced and who need a platform to uh, manage uh, higher level operations. The starting point is educating clients. And this is because a system based on education is better than any other system. Systems that are not based on education will not go far and is in fact less resilient. This approach was, uh, has been very, has been received positively by the market. We have uh, all, almost 500,000 customers in Italy. How do we raise awareness and how do we educate these clients about this new topic, about what Bitcoin is and about the blockchain technology? Well, first of all, we do that throughout the gamification of learning. Gamification of learning means that we 
gamify uh, learning for our clients and we do that by providing tangible value so we give them a, um, a utility token that is symbolized by a strawberry so the more i buy from a certain supermarket the more points i'll receive from that supermarket so our um, uh, system works quite uh, similarly so we so instead of giving a bonus of five or ten euros so when you register we redistribute this value on the uh, basis of the number of clients that have been uh, educated about this topic so once uh, a client is aware is educated that they are um, offer the service of buying bitcoins and only after that that they can access to the service within this service well we built this exchange in 2018 and the, the legislation was less strict than it was before and uh, likely of the, the last two speeches have been about uh, anti-money laundering and as i said before for us if the two main points are education and gamification so making it easy the third pillar of our activity is uh, about compliance since uh, the very first day of our activity, we decided, we understood that uh, creating a company was based on generating trust on uh, uh, on such a blurred market. Market. So we had to position ourselves on the side of those who uh, comply with the regulations. We had to. Um, make clear that we were against those actors who uh, exploit the market for their own uh, benefits and they do it illegally so uh, because this behavior can be um, uh, profitable on the short run but it's not profitable on the long run so we're uh, working uh, uh, and our perspective is uh, a long one so we had when, when making this choice and so we made it to be competitive on the market so we opened up operativity for our clients on italian bank accounts so our clients can deposit their euros on banca sella banco zoaglio and other banks that we've been working on this is an important guarantee for our clients because clients working with young are not sending money to the cayman islands that they know that they are doing it throughout um uh, renowned italian institutions when it comes to the anti-laundering, uh, I mean, this is the most important aspect we deal with because we manage uh, amounts of money, not only in, a, in fiat currency, that is to say euros, uh, we, um, and we, uh, I, we analyze all the time the financial profile of each uh, client and the origin of the um, flows of money at the moment we also analyze the uh, flows of money in cryptocurrencies at the moment uh, there's this tendency of thinking that uh, cryptocurrencies are a main tool for anti-laundering cryptocurrencies are considered as a tool for anti-laundering but it is not the, the most important tool that's because as intermediaries, so we have tools that can track down a fraction of a Bitcoin, and it allows us to identify by these uh, elements by being extremely transparent, and we can see the old process of that Bitcoin. And if this Bitcoin went through high risk wallets, uh, the uh, uh, risk rate of this Bitcoin is extremely high. And if this risk rate is extremely high, we can uh, deny the storage of that Bitcoin. The same applies for the withdrawal of crypto values, the cryptocurrencies, because if one of our car clients try to withdraw cryptocurrency, 
and in order to bring it to a high risk exchange we can um, stop this uh, transaction and uh, um, put into place uh, the uh, SOS. We've seen that uh, uh, they are 4,000 out of uh, 100,000 transactions. This is only 4% of the global transaction. Our value proposal allowed us to achieve an important result. In fact, nowadays we are market leaders in Italy. We've managed to do very well in terms of turnover and in terms of the amount of clients so together with uh, the most important stakeholders of the market. We are an Italian startup that was born, born within the University of Turin, made of students of the University of Turin. We were born within, we were, I mean, we know that the Italian market has uh, a smaller dimension if it is uh, um, compared to the Silicon Valley, for example. However, the factor that determines the success of the company is not only about their turnover, it's also about uh, uh, having uh, uh, successful ideas. And the idea of uh, putting education and compliance at the forefront allowed us to, um, uh, to be uh, that successful. So we are now ready to expand all over Europe and uh, we want to start with countries that are most similar to Italy. They are France and Spain. And this is because our objective on the uh, medium run is that of strengthening our position in Southern Europe. Uh, our staff is young. The average age of the funders is 23 years old. The average age of the staff who are 45. Uh, most of them are based in Turing and is uh, 27, 28 years of age, so our average age is quite uh, uh, low. We have created a model that allow us to uh, create a strong company based on institutional stakeholders, uh, of, uh, which is uh, United Venture, which is the most important venture capital in Italy which is based on a substrate of managers coming from uh, banking institutions with a strong experience that uh, want to go for uh, regulation and that this the fact that we're so young allow the company to be very quick, to be dynamic, and allow the company to be able to adapt to the needs of the new generation of investors in a way that is in line with the real needs of uh, the sector, differently from what uh, 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 traditional banks uh, exploring cryptocurrencies try to do. My, uh, I wanted to conclude by highlighting that if we think that uh, the key factor of a good currency is trust at the moment, unfortunately, the traditional financial systems showed us that we can't trust the traditional financial systems. And we've also seen that the, uh, the behavior of central banks showed that if we decide we want to build our value, on assets such as fiat currencies, these assets are not efficient and that's because the main asset of this market, which is Bitcoin, is a currency which performs much better than fiat currencies, fiat money, and that's because and that's because we invest in technology. A Bitcoin was twenty-five thousand dollars in January, and now it. I mean, it is important to understand that volatility is not due by the, the final supply, 
but it is due to the fact that the capitalization of the asset is a very limited one. So if the capitalization of the asset increases, so the volatility decreases, and that's because now you need 1 billion euros to be trans, 1 billion Bitcoin to be transferred in one second. And that a billion that has been transferred will have an impact that equals 1%. So the, uh, the crypto currency reliability cannot be uh, uh, compared to um, to the uh, traditional currencies. Well, it depends on several assets. I mean, there's no central bank, but there's uh, more technology. So you should trust the protocol. Thank you very much for your uh, intervention and enjoy the next meeting. I'm sorry, I have to ask the next two speakers to be very brief. Now we're going to leave the floor to Luca Colognola from KMG, who's going to talk about energy communities, which are expanding thanks to the uh, tax breaks provided by several uh, countries and uh, cryptocurrencies uh, may give a positive impact to this sector. Thank you. Well, what I want to tell you is my uh, experience in the energy communities. And it's very interesting from two points of view. First, there is no cryptocurrencies involved. In this case, we we'll talk only about blockchain. So technology playing a role, as Professor Fazio said, as notary, as register, ledger of what is happening in the community. And the other interesting aspects is the energy communities, which is very innovative. Uh, this project was started in 2019 and giving you an, uh, an idea of how a para public um, institution can uh, be innovative. I'll try to be as short and brief and as possible, just a very short introduction of what uh, energy communities are. There are different kinds of energy communities. Um, uh, you can, I'm sure you all know someone having photovoltaic panels on the roofs of their houses. So uh, photovoltaic uh, panels could be used in um, detached houses. In energy communities, this possibility is extended to more subjects who can associate and they can share energy. So where, the, where is the main difference in a community, uh, uh, energy community, and with the different types of energy communities that we have, there are different types of subjects involved. So there are producers and consumers and pro prosumers producing and consuming. So the main advantages is um, getting closer, getting the production and the use of energy closer, the one to the other. And you produce and you consume the energy that has been produced with a particular attention to energy saving. And you also help the national network. Um, the energy produced or consumed in the Italian territory uh, is managed by Terna. Terna brings the energy from the producer to the consumers and transform energy to from high tension to low voltage uh, energy. And it grants that we all have electricity in our houses. <clears throat> Managing the balance between supply and demand. So it has to uh, expect uh, the demand and adjust the supply accordingly, 
otherwise we have a lack of energy or satisfaction. The use of renewable energies, which are more sustainable and have more have a lot of advantages, but they are not reliable because they um, they depend on the weather. And so, if there is the sun, we can pr we can use photovoltaic panels. If there is wind, we can use uh, wind parks. Otherwise, it's not possible. So changing the production close uh, to the consumer is an advantage and does not overload the national networks. The subjects involved in this process are the national um, um, energy manager, which is GSE in Italy. <clears throat> Um, the Italian state uh, gives incentives to those uh, wanting to install uh, photovoltaic panels on their roofs on their uh, in the on their houses. There is a, a manager of the community, so a reference person who has to distribute the GSE incentives to the members of the community, producers, consumers, and prosumers. And uh, it's very difficult that the community is self-sufficient, so there must be um, a network manager. And um, the GSC has launched a blockchain system to experiment the use of new technology, focusing on blockchain. The energy communities were at the very beginning and we were asked to change some mechanisms to adjust to the laws which were changing and supported the development of this innovative technology innovation in the sector of energy uh, i won't go into details uh, about the process um, which is contained on in a video but the blockchain uh, technology help to trace all operations of ex energy exchange and incentive exchange as if they were notaries. So all the uh, exchanges are certified. <clears throat> uh, if the uh, manager of the network asks the, citiz the citizens to save energy, to uh, reduce the consumption of energy or ask to produce more energy, that performance can be remunerated through tokens that can be used on marketplace to buy products and services. So the forms of incentives can also be changed. And so it's not uh, the state anymore giving incentives to individual uh, citizens, but rather incentives give, being given to a group for a positive performances. Uh, the platform that we created can be, um, can be applied to other systems. Uh, so we have a web portal, we have a mobile app, and where you can have inputs for virtuous um, behaviors and performances, and you can see uh, how the production is going, how the consumptions are. And then there is a certification of flaws. Of flaws. I'll try to be as short as possible. Just if you can start the video, please. <clears throat> you can find it on our website. We cannot hear anything. Uh, can you please share the audio, the sound as well?
Il gruppo di autoconsumzione. The GSE as per law, law decree 16219 and the deliber deliberation that you see on, on this slide and the ministerial degree dated 16 September 2020, there are incentives for shared energy services. So a proof of concept was developed to simulate a group of users of the electricity. The simulator can enhance and monitor the incentive mechanism of the shared energy uh, flows but also the uh, life cycle of plants and the behaviors of users. The main objective of this experiment is simulating the behaviors of users in a community, in an energy community or in a collective uh, self-consumption <coughs> group and the way that uh, incentives are used and a mechanism for new forms of management and premiums was developed for um, rewarding um, virtuous consumers and it used blockchain for its transparency. Such technology enables to register on a distributed and accessible ledger the data on consumption, production and um, storage um, of energy with smart contracts. So all the information on exchanges of electricity are registered in the community or in the collective self-consumption self uh, group. All the data will be available to all members of the group through their smartphones, smartphones or web browser. The certification of data enable the uh, manager of energy services to access and have uh, visibility and monitor all the flows the manager of the community or of the group has the possibility to send signals to users on flexibility requests uh, on their behaviors. Such requests can stimulate virtuous performances like uh, optimizing uh, the consumption or um, take into consideration general, general um, uh, information on the energy system. They all the consumers receive uh, information and requests of modulation of their behaviors through the web or through smartphones. And so they can decide how to behave accepting the requests for more flexibility. By answering to the inputs given by the manager, uh, the users will be rewarded uh, some tokens or cryptocurrency and so they will have a digital wallet and with those tokens and cryptocurrency together with the incentives the users will be rewarded for their um, positive behaviors even uh, economic transactions are um, managed on blockchain the token, which are accrued by users in the community, can be spent uh, for uh, purchasing uh, goods and uh, and services on um, on on stores on the web. So on every store accepting electronic currency, blockchain becomes like a notary of the uh, group or of the community by registering all the transactions. So every subject has the possibility to have a full view of what happens in the community and of their behaviors. Uh, increasing the awareness of the impact of their own action. The role of blockchain is certifying the data of the process so that uh, premiums can be calculated for each users. 
in order to do so, uh, smart contracts are used and they are a sort of agreement among actors of the blockchain, uh, which analyzes the rules among users on the network. So that's why it's a smart uh, contract. The introduction of shared rules, transparency in managing behaviors, and the registration of shared energy and its enhancement and the uh, premium formulas are a qualifying aspect for the use of uh, technology uh, blockchain platforms for energy exchanges, promoting uh, virtuous behaviors by the uh, members of the groups or the communities and encouraging responsible practices. The realization and the dissemination of um, um, such systems can benefit from the use of uh, technologies using distributed ledgers, making the process more reliable and so that the users can trust the system. Thank you. I think that it could be an interesting um, example on how the blockchain can support intelligent and interesting projects uh, on energy in this. We have Marco Monaco uh, on last speech on the strategic value of blockchain. On the case of El Salvador, which is the last country in the world accepting uh, uh, cryptocurrency as a legal uh, currency. And I think this is an experience that is worth mentioning. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Well, I think I've shared my screen with you so that we can see my presentation together. Yes, perfect. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me here today. While organizing this meeting, we talked about the topic I was going to uh, talk about today. And we've talked about uh, ESG practices, which are related to the environment. So we try to give a totally different point of view about energy by mentioning the case of El Salvador. When we talk about ESG, we're not only talking about the environment, because environment is not the only letter of the acronym ESG, Environment Social Governance. So today we would like to focus on the S, which is the uh, social dimension of ESG. This is the topic that is uh, uh, less uh, considered when uh, talking about ESG. However, we think that the social dimension of ESG can make the difference about trust and inclusion. ESG is a cross-cutting topic that is becoming more and more important in the post pandemic phase, the pandemic we have faced has highlighted the need for social equality. And that's because uh, the good part of the real economy stopped to the advantage of the digital economy. Let's now move on to one of the pillars of ESG, which is financial inclusion. These are data related to e-commerce. In 2019, the global e-commerce sales jumped to 26.7 trillion 
up 4% from a year earlier. If we have a look at the payment method used for online transactions, we can see that the most popular method for e-commerce transaction was based on banking payments. via digital electronic tools in projections for 2024 provide for digital payment uh, jumping up to 98%. When we deal with e-commerce and uh, financial inclusion, we have to uh, uh, assess the two sides of the same coin. The first one is linked to uh, the trends in consumption. If a consumer wants to buy online, they need the digital payment method. On the other hand, we have to consider online businesses. Let's just think about a company that uh, is not present online. The World Bank estimates that these companies uh, will shut down uh, soon. This is also due to the effects uh, of the pandemic. So if you want to sell online, you need to access a banking system of a digital financial system. It means that financial inclusion is key if we want to reduce the inequalities of our society and that have a strong impact on the social pillar of ESG. This introduction leads us to uh, cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies may be considered as a boost for financial inclusion. When we deal with financial inclusion, we deal with several topics. And now we're going to focus on one specific topic that is related to the unbanked. An unbanked is uh, is a person that may live in a rural or extreme poor uh, area and uh, where infrastructures uh, do not uh, um, cannot support a digital branch or a physical branch of a bank. An unbanked person is also a person that uh, lives in an area in which there are no uh, identification tools uh, for the digital world. So these are people who can't open up a bank account or uh, to register to a digital payment method because the area where they live in uh, lacks of identification method. There is also another uh, problem, which is the problem of younger generations. New generations have an alternative, which is the uh, cryptocurrencies. It can be an alternative to uh, the bank system. So for uh, new generations, so they do not even have to talk about the opt out from a banking system because they are crypto native. They may not even uh, opt for a banking system. They could just opt uh, for uh, for cryptocurrency. And these people are unbanked. At the same time, several analysis uh, tells us that the uh, diffusion of uh, uh, smartphones uh, is on the increase, regardless of the um, of the uh, lifestyle of certain areas. Cryptocurrencies uh, remove uh, the need for a key YC. 
And it is true, a service provider has to implement uh, compliance procedures and they have to abide uh, to the new regulations. But the real point is that a cryptocurrency can be used regardless of the services surrounding that person uh, by a person who has a certain level of skills and can also be used by uh, people who are located at a low level of the well-being of Let's just think about uh, the uh, cross-border transactions and let's just think about uh, remittances. And we could also uh, streamline access to credit. Financial inclusion doesn't refer only to uh, the possibility of Paying it is also uh, it also refers to the possibility to, to access credit. Quindi non è solo un tema di, uh, di pagamenti, ma è anche so un tema di... Non è solo un tema di pagamenti, ma è anche un tema di... Non siamo parlando di tema principale. Ora parliamo di questo caso studi, di El Salvador. El Salvador è un paese piccolo di Latino America. Il paese di cittadini dei quali ha 6.6 milioni di cittadini, con cui ha 74% di cittadini locali in locali in locali the extension of the country is 20,000 uh, square kilometers and their GDP is $24.64 billion. More than 30% of El Salvador GDP comes from remittances, meaning that the large part of the population depends on money transfers from the outside of the country. Uh, this collides uh, with the very complex reality where the cost of a remittance from the United States of America to El Salvador can be up to 10, 30% of the value of the transfer. It means that I send uh, $100 from the US to El Salvador, 10 or 30% of that $100 is spent on uh, transfer, on the transfer of money. The other important element to add is that approximately 70% of the population in El Salvador is unbanked. The population depends widely on US dollars. And since most of them are unbanked, they use uh, the uh, mm, bills that are uh, minted by another country. So the country issued a, leg, uh, a regulation that came into force on the 9th of June 2021. In fact, El Salvador became the first country that made um, Bitcoin as a legal tender within the country. Most players, such as the European Central Bank and other European institutions, think that bitcoins cannot be declared as a currency because it lacks of certain basic principles of accounts of a currency. So since nobody issues it, it cannot be, their value cannot guarantee, hence, uh, moreover, their volatility is quite high. So Bitcoin is just a medium of exchange and as such cannot be defined as a currency. 
these ideas were questioned when uh, Bitcoin became a legal tender in El Salvador. However, El Salvador cannot uh, mint this uh, uh, currency, Bitcoin. So there's still the question, the open question of uh, who um, issues uh, uh, a Bitcoin. So a Bitcurrency cannot be defined as a currency. It is not as safe uh, as a traditional currency. Could you please speed up to your conclusions because uh, we are running out of time. I'm very sorry about that. Okay, quite quickly. So what is the expected result uh, from the law that has been promoted by El Salvador instead of increasing the actual value of remittances because a transaction with Bitcoin throughout the Lightning Network method provides for a, a quick transfer of money. It is also free of charge. However, if in the US I have dollars and I want to send them to El Salvador, I have to convert dollars into Bitcoin and then I can make the transactions. And according to the skills of those who are doing those transactions may have uh, may cost five per from uh, five percent to zero point five percent if I use uh, some other exchange methods. The other objectives of the government of El Salvador, instead of decreasing the number of uh, unbanked people by digitalizing. Uh, payments of these people and by allowing them to have access of ad, to other uh, financial services and reducing their dependence on the US dollar. So they want to increase the number of people who are neutral, who are um, independent uh, of the inflation of uh, uh, the US dollar. As a stimulus, uh, uh, the government gave $30 in Bitcoin to all citizens of El Salvador. Uh, these are people who went for the national bill uh, Bitcoin wallet. And the government declared that if they had to, um, to provide $30 in uh, $30 to all uh, citizens of El Salvador that would have had to spend a lot of money for the distribution of this money, while with Bitcoin this was free of charge. So El Salvador acquired a reserve, a Bitcoin reserve, about 750 uh, Bitcoins, both between $40,000 and $50,000. Uh, dollars. Uh, they created a stained on company to provide Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin wallet services. It is called the Chivo Wallet, a state owned BTC USD exchange to provide FX liquidity between dollars and BTC has been created. This has been uh, paid by the state and uh, end users do not have to pay anything. Moreover, uh, 200 ATMs have been installed to offer Bitcoin US dollar conversion without a conversion fees. Moreover, training and educational programs have been uh, issued uh, to the population. The also roadmap has been established. This, is um, this includes volcano mining and one billion dollar Bitcoin bond and the first bond will have to finance the construction of a Bitcoin city. Moreover, a whole series of programs to access services related to um, the access to credit has been promoted. So Bitcoin has have been has been key in order to uh, reduce the number of unbanked people and in order to reduce the financial inequality among the population. My last slide is about the results that have been pursued over the past two months since the beginning of since this regulation came into force. These are the data. Half of the population has used and this is still actively using Bitcoin wallets. Uh, 
So we're talking about 3 million citizens. An average of $2 million per day in remittances are transacted through the Chivo wallet, which is the state wallet. Uh, $400 million per year is, estimated, is the estimated savings on remittance fees. An average of more than 65 transactions per second on Chivo wallets uh, take place. So it's only one part of what the government can see because uh, citizens can do whatever they want with their Chivo wallets. Uh, since September the 7th, that is to say when the, the law came into force, citizens of El Salvador have inserted more cash to buy Bitcoin than what they are withdrawing from the Chivo wallet ATMs. Thanks two schools and a pet hospital have been funded with the BTC Bitcoin profits due to the price increase. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We would like to remind you that these presentations are a major step forward within uh, of a process of study that took place uh, that started in 2021 and that we will keep uh, um, uh, doing in the next uh, year. Thank you very much for your attention.